And when they say, as they often do, as I hear when I'm in the, uh, in the States, you know, that the left is dead, I was just thinking the people who say that are actually just living in the wrong place. <laughs> um, uh, this, uh, the title of uh, this session is Backlash, uh, the uh, right in response to Obama's America. And I think the best place to start with even the word and the understanding of backlash is to ask whatever happened to the lash. <laughs> <laughs> it was once the case that before there could be a backlash, there first had to be a lash. Before Margaret Thatcher's anti trade union legislation in the 80s, there was a period of trade union militancy in the 70s. Before the Ku Klux Klan was formed in 1866, there was first the emancipation of slaves following the American Civil War in 1965. And that didn't necessarily make the backlash more palatable or justifiable. The backlash is something that right-wing people do, like kept hair and coof behaviour, references to a left-wing backlash are rare indeed. But the notion of backlash from the right should first be provoked by a lash from the left certainly made the backlash more logical. It was a function of the ebb and flow of the political time. In order for reactionaries to react, radicals first had to act. So the lash did not proceed the backlash, it was the premise for it, not just a matter of sequence but a consequence. And while no one on the left necessarily likes them, everyone expects and understands a right wing backlash for what it is. For lack of call and response, a good Baptist says the backlash had symmetry, but nothing else in itself. But at some stage, the equilibrium has got widely out of sync. As the power and influence of the left has diminished, the lash has all but disappeared. But somehow, the backlash never ends. Welcome to America in the age of Obama, where a right-wing backlash is in full swing, even as the lash of the left remains absent. Uh, now, this has been emerging, this, this uh, right-wing backlash, for some time, but has really gained force in the years since I have been, uh, since I was here last, and particularly among uh, what I'm known as the, uh, the Tea Party uh, movement. <coughs> now, there are various ways of describing the Tea Party movement, not all of them pleasant, but to get at the root of who these people are and uh, what they're about, I think it first um, <coughs> is important to look at their demographics. Now, the Tea Party movement first, uh, I don't know whether it's first and foremost, but um, importantly, is a white movement. It's white people. Uh, that doesn't make it inherently worse, uh, um, and certainly it doesn't make it inherently better, but it makes it <laughs> in, uh, important. Uh, because when uh, references are made to the Tea Party, for example, there was a poll that said they represent 18% of the American population identified with the Tea Party. Well, actually, 18% of the American population is about 25% of white people, and that's who we're talking about. So then you get to see that it's actually a fairly strong, or at least not insignificant current uh, within white America. Now, as I intimated, that doesn't necessarily make it a racist movement, and in any case, to ask where racism ends and politics begins in America is to set up a false dichotomy because American politics has always been steeped in race and racism is a political force. The cycles of stars and centuries are not removed in one election or as a result of one person. Indeed, they may be deepened and may even more as a result of them. But race is undoubtedly a part of it. In Little Rock, Arkansas, a city that's 40% black in a state that is 80% white, I attended an anti-tax Tea Party rally that had not one single black attendee apart from an anti-abortion speaker. Um, the doubts that the Tea Party had cast on Obama's Christianity and his birthplace, because many of them argued he wasn't born in America, are really they're xenophobic, but actually uh, an Islamophobic part of them, but they are in many ways proxies for race, a bit to cast him as an ultimate other. 
And as you know, there were four rally in Washington last September. There were several racist black lives. One said the zoo has an African lion and the White House has a lion African. Another said cap Congress and trade Obama back to Kenya. And uh, if for a moment we step back and look at where many of these people are, uh, have come from, because they have a history, we can see that they've done this before with other people, they did it with um, John Kerry, uh, when they switched on it, they did it with uh, Bill Clinton. If you look at the attacks that are made on various Democrats, even if they're not particularly liberal, then we can see that to understand this as exclusively racial would be uh, why it would be a problem with the uh, mis characterize the nature of it. But there are some important reasons uh, why it matters, not least because in three key ways white America does see itself as being in decline, and actually uh, to some extent is in decline. Demographically, by 2042 white America, white Americans will be the minority. Uh, there will be no one racial or ethnic majority. Economically, because of uh, eight year, or emerging from eight years of growth, white America is also in economic decline. Uh, white wages are stagnant and white poverty is rising. And geopolitically, um, America is no longer the force <coughs> that it was. And this has been tested. Uh, um, uh, to its limits in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, and being found wanting. Simultaneously, the rise of China and India and so on <coughs> forces a reckoning with uh, that assumption about uh, white supremacy both at home and abroad. Now, Obama's election didn't create these anxieties, but having a black man with a foreign sounding man who's traveled the world has simply provided a focus for him. He is an emblem of many things that many white people in America fear. And, um, but his election also proved that there is a vast constituency, particularly among the young, um, who don't share those uh, anxieties or who have different responses to uh, those anxieties. Now, an important thing to remember, and I, 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 I mentioned this last year, but it's become more acute now, about Obama and his election is that despite the dominant narrative, the dominant narrative that we heard here, and uh, uh, actually primarily throughout the rest of the world, that his election had united the country, um, that uh, the country was, had moved on to a different moment in its racial and political uh, um, story. But the fact is he won only 52% of the vote. 47% of people voted for Republican. And for all his aspirations for bipartisanship, he had, after three months, the most polarized um, job approval ratings of any president in four decades. The gap between how Democrats and Republicans rated him was greater than George Bush Jr. in 2001, and twice as high as Richard Nixon in the, at the height of Vietnam War in 1969. Now, this is partly because Democrats helped him so much. But it was also because Republicans hated him so much. Once again, he didn't create that divide, but he inherited it. And not only has he been nominated to cure it, but his presence seems to have exacerbated it. So who else, apart from being uh, white, are these Tea Party people? Well, they are wealthier and better educated than the public at large. But once again, if you calibrate this, uh, in terms of the white population, then you see that they are actually only slightly wealthier and only slightly uh, better educated. And they are no less, no, no more or less afraid of falling into a lower socioeconomic class than the rest um, of the country. 55% of them are concerned that someone in their household will be out of a job in the next year. More than two thirds say the recession has been difficult or caused hardship uh, and major life changes. And like most Americans, they think the most pressing problems facing the country today are the economy and jobs. Class-wise, they are petty bourgeois, funded by rich people, but not 
driven by them. Most of the uh, leaders of the Tea Party movement, either, such as it has any leadership, were small business people, small businessmen. Uh, otherwise, they tend to be Republican, male, married, and older than 45. So it's a development rather than a paradigm shift from mainstream republicanism that emerged from Nixon's southern strategy. The, the, the race-based strategy that emerged from the early 70s that the republicans could win over the South with coded, uh, coded messages about, uh, about race, Willie Horton, I uh, think of um, George Bush speaking at Bob Jones University where interracial relationships were banned uh, until very recently. Uh, that they could, uh, by appealing to these racial codes, uh, they could rally a significant number of the white working class away from the Democrats that had been the party of um, the Confederacy. When um, uh, Johnson signed his uh, uh, civil rights act, he said he was signing away the South for a generation. So we're coming up to the second generation then, and uh, it's still gone. Final thing is that these people are sustained and nurtured by the media. The media didn't create this by any manner of the media. But you have to imagine in Britain that there is a left wing <coughs> channel that for the last two weeks has been saying, you must go to Marxism. Last of is Slender. Zizek will be here. See the robot thing will be there. You'll have a great time. Bring the children. Um, uh, this is what Fox News do. This is what talk radio is. So, their demonstrations should be big. They're promoted pretty much routinely on 24 hour news channels. They have um, advocates, actually, some of them, like going back to Stark. Um, uh, their own uh, movements. And so uh, that is also an important factor, not least because, coming to the second point about them, because it creates a kind of um, a, a discreet and I would say fetid ecosystem in which these people live, in which they trade information on the basis of their own prejudices, which may or may not have anything to do with reality. So the second thing to know about this, uh, uh, this movement is that it is delusional. Um, I say that advisedly, it's quite easy to poke fun at the American right, particularly in, a, um, uh, in an arena like this. But I just wonder if they have to make it as easy as they do. <laughs> <laughs> there are some blatant Blatant <laughs> contradictions and discrepancies that they just simply won't, uh, they have no problem holding together in their head at the same time. The very people who claim that Adam is a Muslim were the ones who assumed about his relationship with Reverend, Reverend Jeremiah Wright, his pastor in Chicago. Muslims don't have a pastor. <laughs> Last year, the Arabic Investors Business Daily claimed that the renowned scientist Stephen Hawking were British. Um, that he would, that uh, Stephen Hawking would be alive if he were not British. <laughs> Stephen Hawking is alive. <laughs> and he's British. <laughs> I was in a bar in Lexington uh, doing a BBC documentary uh, about um, uh, Obamaphobia. And um, I was in this um, non alcoholic bar, don't know. <laughs> I, I had a poll of, uh, there were 16 uh, people from the 912 movement. The 912 movement was created by Glenn Beck, who is a Fox News um, uh, uh, presenter. And his idea was that the country should return to the, um, the feelings that it had the day after 9-11. Um, uh, feelings of nationalism and patriotism when they all stood as Americans and uh, wanted to play the war the rest of the world. And um, that last bit was mine. <laughs> but um, I asked them, there were 16 of them, and I asked them to put their hand and tell me, so how many of you think Obama is? Now, none of them thought he was a Christian. Two of them out of 16 thought he was American. 
um, 12 thought he was Muslim, um, uh, 3 thought he was a legitimate president of the United States. And they said to me, the problem with all of this, because I, I said to them, you know, people outside this bar or this state would be surprised to hear you say that. And they said, well, the problem is with the media, people just aren't getting the facts. How many, of you, how many of you watch Fox News? 16. <laughs> um, there was Kenneth Gladney, a, um, a campaigner, an anti health reform uh, campaigner in St. Louis, who started a fight, as far as I can understand, he started the fight, but the fight broke out between him and um, some pro healthcare people. And uh, he got the worst of it. And he had to go to hospital. The <laughs> was that Kenneth Manley campaigning against health care who doesn't have health insurance. So he had to ask for a whip ramp uh, to pay for his health care. Now these contradictions are funny until you realise how widespread they are and they become a little bit scary. A recent Harris poll reveals that a majority of Republicans believe Obama is a Muslim and a socialist you want to turn over the sovereignty of the US to a one world government. <laughs> Daily Post poll in January showed that about two thirds of Republicans believe or not sure that Obama is a racist who hates white people. And more than half believe or are not sure that he was born in the US and wants the terrorists to win. <laughs> now, the potential, if you believe this, then there are consequences to that, clearly. So the potential for this kind of rhetoric to produce an unthinkable calamity shouldn't be underestimated. Um, a Homeland Security report last year called Right Wing Extremism concluded that the economic downturn and the election of the first African American president present unique drivers for right wing radicalization and recruitment. People turn up in the Obama's rallies armed. Oh. And some, there was one guy who turned up with a t shirt and said, um, We should uh, uh, water the tree of liberty, uh, which is a quote from. Um, uh, sorry? Jefferson. Thomas uh, Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson. Yeah. <coughs> that, um, uh, that the tree of liberty should be watered by the blood of uh, patriots. Um, so this is a, a, a direct call to, uh, uh, to violence. Um, so there is this move. And, um, uh, and in the absence of kind of uh, proper facts, People then start acting on the facts that they think they know. And moving on from the delusion, we will come back to it soon because it, it's like arsenic in the water supply has got right spread right throughout the, uh, 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 the right. There is a manner in which the, uh, these Tea Party people pose as, and actually believe themselves, I don't think it's just a pose, as anti politics, a plague on all your houses. When I asked this group in Lexington, Kentucky to put up their hands as they blame Obama for the current uh, state of America, only three or four did. And when I asked them to uh, um, ask them if they blame Bush, about the same number did. Uh, and uh, when I said, do you just blame all the politicians, that's when the hand went. And, um, uh, and in that sense, you know, they are unruly, incoherent, incoherent. They had a, they are already dissidents. They had a Tea Party uh, uh, convention, and then a section of it refused, I mean, some, uh, in some ways, of the, of the British hard left, or any hard left. But then there were dissidents to the dissident faction, and then there were dissidents to that faction, and, <laughs> and they, they ended up not being able to hold, really, a coherent uh, convention. Telling me, in terms of their views on political leaders, less than half believe that Sarah Palin is qualified to be uh, uh, president. And most of them that I met don't want to leave. Frank Luntz, who I um, interviewed uh, in another thing for the BBC, who's a uh, uh, right-wing Republican strategist, has met with them a few times, he said, and asked them, he said it was not doing their credibility any good that they kept comparing the government to Hitler and that they should be more strategic in the two of them And he said, um, uh, this is quoting him verbatim, but they don't want to be told. 
They don't want to be lectured, they don't want to be advised, educated, or informed. He said that he felt pleased. I said, well, how does that make you feel as a strategist? He said, I'm just pleased when I come out of the meeting with them and my tie is on the side. So some people have been led to believe that they think that these people might perform a third party. And that seems unlikely to me. Highly unlikely. For all their aggressive and uncompromising rhetoric, these people are Republicans. The percentage of the Tea Party movement that holds a favourable opinion of uh, President uh, Bush, the last President Bush, is 57%, which almost exactly matches the percentage in the general public that holds an unfavourable view of him. But the extent to which they represent the Republican reservists can be overstated. The last time the Republicans enjoyed a huge election was through 1994, the Gingrich Revolution. But back then, all but two Republican House representatives signed up to the contract with America, a manifesto with a clear set of demands written by the party leadership with the help of the Right Wing Heritage Foundation. Conversely, this current surgeons has been inspired by fractious groups of right wing activists and, um, and funded by uh, right wing. Uh, think tank. But these people were never Democrats, and they're not going to be Democrats, and they're not going to stand against Republicans. So how seriously should we take them? Well, their emphasis can be over-exaggerated. Uh, a February Washington Post poll shows that 43% of Americans know very little or nothing about what the two parties stand for. Their victories so far have been fairly low in Republican primaries that won in Utah, Kentucky, uh, and Florida. They're also, uh, or are winning, and also, they're also doing very well in Arizona. Uh, and um, to the extent to which they're gaining, there are some independents that have been leaving the Republican Party and think that it's become, uh, it's, it's become uh, uh, too extreme. But they can't be ignored. They are the most dynamic political force on the right. And Republicans are pathetically grateful because there's nothing else going on in that party. There's not there. Um, uh, in many areas, if anything, it's the Tea Party that's effectively making the official establishment of the Republican Party the third party. So the Republican establishment candidate in Florida, Charlie Crist, has left the Republican Party to stand as independent because he just knew that he couldn't win against the previous unknown, Marco Rubio, uh, who is a Tea Party candidate. Similarly, in Pennsylvania, Arlen Specter, who is a more moderate Republican, whatever that is, um, shifted sides to the Democrats because he knew he couldn't win in the Republican uh, Party. And then he actually lost in the Democratic primary. But uh, the point being that fairly mainstream Republicans are the ones who, in any sense, are thinking of things we take and try to carve out their own space. Just as an example of, the, <coughs> of how the delusional nature of this movement has fed into um, the uh, mainstream and how the tail is now wagging the dog, um, the 2008 presidential contender, uh, Republican contender, John McCain, recently insisted that he has never considered himself a mountain. Now, one of his books is subtitled The Education of the American Man. And he called himself The Original Man of his campaign. But never mind. Um, it is John McCain who has invited Sarah Taylor to support him in Arizona because he needs her support. That's a significant turnaround from uh, two years ago. Whereas in 2008, McCain grabbed the microphone uh, famously from an audience member's hand and corrected her after she said she didn't trust Obama because he's an ally. That metaphorical mic has now been returned to her and she's been happy <coughs> to centre stage. Now, um, <clears throat> I spent some time when I was doing this documentary in Floyd County in uh, eastern Kentucky. Uh, where things are tough, more than a quarter of the families in Preston, Pittsburgh, this town there, live uh, uh, in poverty. And half of the children in Floyd County are on food stamps. <coughs> now, they never liked Obama much in Floyd County, it must be 
said, Hillary Clinton won 95% in the primaries. But until recently, they did love Democrats. In 2004, Kerry won the county with 25 point margin. But in 2008, McCain took it by two points. The first time a Republican had won for in living memory. Now that's to say that after Hurricane Katrina, the failure in Iraq, the collapse of the economy, the unraveling in Afghanistan, a sizable portion of Floyd's votes took a look at Obama and decided that this time, for the first time, they would turn their backs on, uh, uh, on the Democrats. I spoke to the local Democratic leader in Floyd County and he was fairly despondent. He said, I would have thought in the past that if Charles Manson ran against a Republican in Floyd County, he would win. But Charles Manson could be Barack Obama here alone. Thousands of miners are out of work, the entire local economy is in the tank, and he's got a couple of years we can turn it around. But if he does that, he could win. But if he doesn't, Charles Manson could come in and win. Now, this brings me back to the lash. And this is where I'd, um, uh, I'd like to uh, end. Because there are um, a couple of things about Obama's presidency so far and in the future that could, uh, well, that explain it and that could uh, turn it around. Um, the first is that we have to understand where he came from. That Obama was never a left. Never. He never said he was. And he wasn't. Um, uh, and so, um, some of the disappointment that surrounds his um, presidency, I would say, is misplaced. But he's also working within a political system that is so crowded with corporate lobbyists that it's incapable of ful fulfilling the wishes of the people who <coughs> wear the public option in healthcare. That's what they want. Now, the fact that he is a product of that system doesn't mean that he's not necessarily dedicated to reforming it. But we can't measure his dedication only his achievements. And so far, those achievements have not been so great. Now, uh, I don't want to give Obama the benefit of the doubt here because he's president and he has enough benefits already. But <laughs> one thing we have to understand in looking at Obama is where, were the, where are those people now? Those people who came out and mixed the from the street, the people who were inspired and moved by him. And the failure to create a movement out of that moment, the, the fact that that remained as a, uh, as a political, as an electoral campaign, the fact that the day after that campaign, they took the list of people, the Obama campaign, and they left town. And so there was no way of mobilizing those people. And so quite often when the left complained about the right um, uh, organizing, I, um, I think that, well, really the problem is not that they are organizing, it's that you're not. And in the absence of any independent organization, where are people supposed uh, to go? And as we come to the halfway mark, Obama's single achievement has been that he's managed to shift the course of political conversation. So we're no longer talking about the dismantling of good things that exist, but the derailing of better things that might come about in general. But the right have come out swinging, uh, and, and, um, uh, and the left are now on the back foot. Without, um, the, the right have not have any proposals of their own, really, but what they can do is stop good things happening. The failure has been, really, that where Obama has managed to push him forward, they have all been all too often inadequate. People don't want a health care reform bill. They want health care. They don't want the stimulus package. They want jobs. And the inability to deliver results that are necessary to relieve the pain on people and the planet risks huge cynicism. We tried it. It didn't work. Why bother trying again? The fact that, and I, I still believe this, that Obama was the best viable candidate does not circumvent the possibility that the best America's electoral politics can offer right now may well be inadequate to the task in hand. The roots and the trajectory of the backlash are clear, but the provenance for the lash has yet to be seen. Thank you very much.
very important starting point when we're talking about American politics at this moment, and Obama in particular, is not to fall into the notion of the great man theory of history. Why right? didn't Obama do this? Is Obama weak? Is he strong? Uh, what kind of guy is he? Um, because he'll be whatever guy we make him be. And, uh, and, uh, and also he'll be whatever guy they make him be. And so the kind of um, the individual proclivities of uh, the man himself can often kind of crowd out uh, a, a broader conversation. But it was a bit, I was running out of time, and, um, and so I, um, I skipped this bit, but it's, it answers some of the questions about what happened to these people. And one thing I would say from uh, one of the contributors is, actually, I think it is difficult to build movements. Uh, and that once people have kind of been demobilized, effectively, um, to kind of, um, to get them back together, to kind of hear that, um, that sense of urgency and activity actually kind of uh, takes time. And the other thing that we often forget is from what a despondent and low base the American, not even the left, just American progressives were coming from. This was eight years of Bush, and Bush even won the second election. This was um, a profound <laughs> period of setbacks. And uh, anyhow, I went to Durham in North Carolina. Uh, where I heard that there was a kind of um, uh, more activity, and I met this woman called Thought the Thoughts. From the moment that she started campaigning for Obama during the primaries, she provided unstinting but never uncritical support. When Obama took North Carolina by a hair threat in November, the first Democrat to do so since Jim Carter, she demanded that the campaign leave its data so that the local group could continue organizing. She literally said to them, We collected those laws. Where are you going? Give them back so that we can carry on. There's, there's no use to you wherever you're going. And anyway, there are our names. And in January, shortly before the inauguration, she called a meeting to talk about what they should do next. And she expected around 40 people to turn up, but more than three times that number came. Okay. We brought together this very diverse, brilliant group of people that it was clear to me that we should not stop. We could not let these people go back into the woodwork. We had to keep going. We never thought Obama would do all the things we wanted to do, and we always knew that we would have to pressure him to get things done. That's how politics works. So they formed working groups, and they started organizing. And one of their principal targets was their local senator, Kay Hagan, who swept in on Obama's coattails, but then was dragging her feet on all the major votes. <coughs> and they just gave her very little wiggle room. Uh, and uh, Faulkner said, we flooded her voice from her. We visit her, email her, get people to write her letters. She always knows we're here. She doesn't write a thing in the end, but we have to make her. And this uh, uh, raises for me a, a, a quote after um, the trade unionist and civil rights leader, A. Philip Brandoff, demanded that Franklin Roosevelt integrate the military. And Roosevelt responded famously, I agree with you, I want to do it, now make me do it. And there is uh, an issue, and this is not, this is no way should let Obama off the hook about anything, but Obama cannot reasonably be expected to organize the left opposition to himself. <laughs> so, <laughs> we, have to, we have to have a kind of um, a conversation about what's happened that's, um, uh, that's broader than just him and what he did to us. There's also the, the, the issue of what we are doing or haven't done uh, to or at him. Um, with regard to what's kind of qualitatively uh, new, I would say a few things. The media is qualitatively new. I mean, that's something that um, uh, Fox News, Russian Limbaugh, and so on, that wasn't around during the 80s. Limbaugh was growing in the mid 90s, and, and really Fox came into its own under the uh, uh, impeachment um, saga with uh, Clinton. But that's, that's something that's new and fairly, um, uh, and, uh, fairly different. And also, the other thing that's new and that helps characterize this thing is that while they're the same people, there is a difference in intensity than there was against Clinton or Carter. Precisely because of what Obama represents, that kind of, uh, uh, he's black, Foreign sounding name, he appears cosmopolitan, 
And so he becomes an emblem for fears amongst some, uh, racial fears, uh, uh, fears about globalization, and, um, and xenophobia, um, can all be just rolled into one uh, person. It's also important to bear in mind that Obama has done some stuff. He's not just been kicking it in the White House. That the health care reform, and this is the point of it really, it was inadequate. Um, short of a mass campaign outside of organized electoral policies, it's difficult to, to see how within the electoral system, for all of the flaws that there are in it, in it that anything better was going to emerge. That it wasn't just a, um, a sign of his weakness as a person, that they didn't get the public option. There weren't the votes. And that is not to give them benefit of the doubt, as I said, it's just to kind of explain and map out a, a reality. There could have been the votes, but for there to be the votes, there would have to be more people like former Fox putting the pressure on their local senator. And those efforts were sadly all um, too patchy. But the health care vote, the similar package, a whole heap of things that we look at what the Tories are doing there. If the pain had won, we'd be having some very different conversations. And one of the hardest problems is that the best that he can say to a large numbers of people are, you should see what the other guy has done. <laughs> and that that is put food on your table and it doesn't get you a job as a children. Um, uh, the question about um, why the left hasn't done better, which is kind of really uh, above my pay grade, but I would say race is definitely a question. The, the issue of whether uh, a certain section of the white working class can see black people as possible um, um, uh, collaborators in a project for a better world rather than threats to their small uh, piece of pie. Um, uh, the weakness of the labor movement uh, also. I said this last year and I'll say it again in terms of the symbolic value of it. The symbolic value of Obama's victory cannot be understated. Um, it can be understated though. And it's important to um, not to confuse the symbols with the substance. So there is, and I'll be talking about this a bit more tomorrow, but there is no necessary link between black or female or any other underrepresented group representation and equality necessarily. Bangladesh uh, it was last year he had an election uh, with two women as uh, presidential contenders. <coughs> That's not doing a great deal for women in Bangladesh. Um, Obama's victory has actually, since he's won, the gap between black and white has actually grown in terms of uh, poverty and uh, unemployment and so on. So um, these are uh, often emblems, often symbols, and not necessarily substance. The connection between the two is, um, is complex. Running very quickly and adequately through uh, some other specific questions. Um, does the uh, design is probably, it's still powerful and still has a major influence. I would argue it has less of an influence than it did, but it fits into that narrative of there's been a shift, Obama's not Bush, um, the Israelis certainly don't think it's Bush, um, uh, there has been uh, some limit, but it's inadequate. So, this, you know, if you look at where we need to be and we look at uh, where America was, and then is Obama over here. It's not enough. Um, and once again, you have to ask, where in America is the pro-Palestinian left? That, that, that expectation that Obama's going to make that journey on his own uh, is really an expectation that he will lead us, and we have to lead him. I mean, if we believe in bottom-up transformation, then we really should be looking for him for leadership. We should be forcing them to follow us. Um, the Arizona law is incredibly important, uh, the, which is uh, uh, excluded large. It basically makes such laws, um, uh, uh, it makes such the law in Arizona so that you can stop someone on suspicion that they are an illegal immigrant, as though you can see illegality in a person's face. Now, um, uh, what's happened in recent, in uh, response to that, is a massive and much needed mobilization of um, uh, Latinos and their allies. And once again, we have three years ago, 
And these were the people who actually created the mass slogan that Obama used, Si se puede, yes we can. That was the, um, that was the slogan of the uh, pro-immigrant demonstrations in, I think it was 2006, 2007. Uh, today we march, tomorrow we vote. That was what they said, but actually they didn't mostly turn out. And after uh, a few of those marches, people went home. And so a means of sustaining these upsurges has not, they're very spontaneous, they're burned brightly, and too, all too often they, uh, uh, they, uh, they disappear with little trace, not with no trace, but with little trace. And so once again, there's been this resurgence. We've just got to hope that in some way they can keep it together and keep a focus, provide a focus. But if they defeat that, they're going to those uh, people gone. Um, BP, in many ways, that situation has revealed Obama's and the American polity's paralysis in the face of big business. That they just let business run the show. And then when they ran a bad show, there was really nothing that they could do. There was no regulation, there were no regulators, there were in, insufficient laws. And so you really see the relationship between capital and politics um, in, uh, in America played out on a, on a uh, grand scale. I think with Afghanistan, the question is really how they are going to choose. It's clearly the most. Um, and the public uh, mood is, uh, has completely gone against them. Uh, people have almost forgotten why they are there. And because all of the links uh, that were made um, with, uh, uh, with um, uh, Al-Qaeda and, um, uh, and Iraq, the whole thing has been confused in the public mind. And clearly they know that they're, they're losing. The question then arises, how does America declare victory from this loss and then leave? And that is quite honestly what I think they're trying to uh, work, out, uh, uh, work out in this moment. Summing up, what Obama really, I think the symbolic importance of Obama's victory was that he showed after this bleak, bleak period in global politics, he showed that there was a mass market, not just in America, but throughout the world, all the people that stayed up, all my family members that stayed up in Barbados and Canada and Ireland and so on, and I'm sure there are many other people. So the next day, everybody was having to stay, or large numbers of people were having the same conversation. It's like if England won anything. <laughs> <laughs> in, in, in England, people were saying, why did you see that? But that was a global move the day after November 5th, 2008. And it showed that there was a mass market for hope. As simple as that, to hope that there was hope, that there was a market for some kind of possibility of uh, even for some people, a utopian vision, what if America can do that? Then who knows? Who knows what's possible coming out of this uh, bleak period? And it showed that there was a potential for alternative narratives that actually, while large numbers of work, while a sequence of bad things have happened, that people in their spirit were not defeated. And the trouble was that Obama himself and his campaign was a completely inadequate conduit for them. And now what we have to do is deal with the gap between those aspirations and the reality. Because in that gap can lie cynicism, but can also lie the potential for mass mobilizations in order to make those hopes a reality.